Hare Krishna, Anattama Prabhu. Thank you very much for joining once again. It was very illuminating last time discussing on the topic of overcoming the Vide mentality. Thank you for sparing your time once again. I'm very happy to be here. I, I think these are very interesting and important topics we're discussing. So thanks for inviting me to be with you again. Thank you, Prabhu. So I thought we could continue today. And there was one thing that we avoid the Vide mentality and then how do we go forward and engage with the world? So I thought we could talk this at, a, at three broad levels. One is as an institution, we engage with the world. As individual devotees, we engage with the world. And then devotees engage with the world practically in their professional and familial roles. So institutionally? Institutionally, indi then individually, it is more as, say, as a devotee, how do I interact with the world? And then I, okay. we also have our familial and professional roles. Yes. You interact with the world. Okay, good. So, Great. thank you. So, which would you, would you like to start with the institutional first or want to start with the individual first? Well, why don't you ask me a specific question and we'll see where we go from there. Okay, yes, thank you. So, basically, generally, like we discussed last time, that the insider-outsider border was very clear. It was almost like a wall between the two in the past. And then if somebody went from inside outside, it was almost like that person had fallen away from spiritual life. That was the idea. Now the insider outsider, there's not so much, we are trying to, you could say lower the wall or remove the wall. So as a, uh, in, as a individual, when a devotee is practicing bhakti and say devotees encounter People with different faith orientations, different worldviews, you know, and sometimes devotees may also encounter people who are in professions that are contrary to our spiritual principles, not only are their practices, but also their professions. So these are various areas where we need to interact in a way that is somewhat likely to create friction. So I could start with you know, an example is that I know a close friend who, when he was introduced to bhakti, he became very rigid about not following anything else. And his family was Maharashtrian. So they used to worship Ganesh quite in a devotional big way. And he said, I won't be a part of the Ganesh worship at all. And that was, the parents were a little upset by that. But then they gave some Ganesh Prasad. So then he said, I'm going not to take any Prasad at all. And his parents insisted, he took the Prasad. And then he went outside the room, then went near a window and threw it out. And one of his relatives saw that. And it was like a furor afterwards. He was almost for some time, he was about to leave. It created so much conflict that his parents were forcing him to leave. But now, I mean, now things have, this was just 20 years ago. Now things have evolved so much that one of those same leaders who had, now nobody told him like this, but that's what he learned from, maybe you could say some kind of osmosis. That's how I should behave. But now I remember one of the leaders, he says that Ganesh Puja is the time where it's like Christmas in the West. At least in Maharashtra, people go to each other's houses. So he says that if somebody gives you prasad, the 364 days, you're taking a normal prasad and one day, one, one morsel of food if you take, which is offered to Ganesh, that's not a big deal. So I think that uh, which battles to fight and which battles are not worth fighting, we as a movement are also maturing now. But this is just one example of say, how an individual may need to engage with the world. Any thoughts on this? Yes, I mean, a lot, lot of thoughts. Um, Last time we, we talked about this idea that we have an understanding that there's standards that need to be maintained. Hmm. We talked about how mm, the standards are kind of like a snapshot, but if you looked at the video, you'd be talking about systems. Yes. Systems are progressive and they're ongoing. So you may take a snapshot of somebody and he's eating meat, and then you take another snapshot and he's eating meat once a week. 
And then you take another snapshot and he's uh, becoming vegetarian. Then you gradually, you, you work your way up. Now he's offering his food like that. So any one of those given snapshots up to pure devotional service is bad in one sense. It's, it's materialistic. Even, you know, one's engaging in the preliminaries of bhakti. Well, we, you can be criticized. Well, you know, you're chanting, but there's no love. Or you, you've mm-hmm. accepted but you haven't given your, your whole life cent per cent. Or, or you're grahastra and you're keeping money aside for yourself. You know what I mean? We, we, we can argue like that. Or we can see it as systematic. Here's a person who's making progress. And that's the key. We want to see that each of us individually and within our communities and the people outside our communities to try to help people be gradually moving towards towards Krishna, towards pure, pure Krishna bhakti. And some people, it takes a little longer. We, we've all had the experience. Some people, they come to the temple and practically, you know, they in, in the early days, especially in the West, sometimes people, they come, and they'd get some first contact, and they'd move into the temple the next day. And some of them never never go away. They just stay. And other people, it takes some time. You know, they, 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 they come one week, and you don't see them for a month, and then they come back, and slowly, and then they start to chant. So different individuals have, we have a different, we have free will, and we're conditioned in different ways. We have different habits. We have different addictions and different things that attract us to Krishna, different obstacles. You know, some people, maybe they come from like an impersonal background, and the idea that God's a person is a big obstacle for them. I, I, I might have mentioned to you, I had a very funny experience. I, I thought it was funny, but interesting. I was at Denver a year ago, Denver, Colorado. The United States is my home temple. I hadn't been there about 10 years. And I gave the Sunday feast, and there was kirtan. And uh, I was speaking with one young Western woman, and, um, and she was very enthusiastic during the kirtan. So I just, you know, took the chance to go over and sit and talk with her a little bit. And she was telling me she'd been coming to the temple for a year or so and how much she loved the kirtan. So I just did kind of like a very simple exchange. I said, well, the reason the the kirtan is so wonderful is because it's not different from Krishna. And she said, no, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. I don't want to hear about God. And I I was completely caught off guard. (laughs) In the kirtan, she's been coming to the temple for a year. She loves the kirtan, and she she just like effusive and how much she appreciated the kirtan. I could see it during the kirtan and the bhajan, and I could see it in, in, in the way she expressed herself. But for her, I don't want to hear about God. Don't give me the God stuff. So like, okay, okay, you know, I just like back right up. <laughs> That's fine. Just come and chant and eat. You know, you don't want to hear about God. That's fine. You know, somebody else, they just come and they, they love to hear about, you know, Krishna is the supreme person and he and he plays with the cows and he's there with Radharani and <laughs> and that's great. But when you talk to them about sadhana, well, if you think God's a person, then you should come downstairs and help wash some pots. Oh, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'll come to listen to the lecture and read, but I'm not going to do any service. I'm not going to give any money, etc. So different people, you know, certain aspects of Krishna, Krishna is all attractive. And he attracts different people in different ways. And different people, because of our material conditioning, there's different blocks. So I think as a general, as a general principle, in answer to your question, with ourselves, with others, and people in the outside world, we're looking at how, as Prophet said, his first purpose, I had it posted here in my wall, to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge. So that means there's a system. There's a way that everything and everybody is benefited some people can, you know, probably says get on the uh, ask the elevator and zoom right to the top. Some people it's a little slower, but that's okay. It's not our position to judge. Our position is to help everyone as best we can uh, to make the next step towards Krishna. And I think that's the same whether we're talking about institutionally or individually or professionally. And that's a, kind of our worldview. Uh, where where can I? It's like you meet someone, someone like on book distribution. An example that comes to my mind. When devotees go on book distribution, you meet one person, and they're like, oh, I've been looking for this. This is wonderful. And, you know, you give them a Bhagavad Gita, and you give them the science of self-realization, and they're getting excited. And then sometimes, like, I know in Europe especially, you know, you see pictures. People go home and get both hands up here. They're walking away with this big, you know, the whole Bhagavatam set, and they're ecstatic, and they write a check for $400, and, and wow. You know, and you meet other people, and it's saying, I'm not interested. Well, what, you know, can I give you this little uh, a free magazine? Okay, I'll take that. That they can do. Or maybe they won't even do that. Okay, well, have a nice day. You can, you can leave them with a good feeling. Oh, I met a Hare Krishna person. They were, this lady I met was very nice. Hare Krishna lady is very nice. So 
one person comes with a vessel that can just take a few drops of water or Krishna Bhakti, somebody else is, to, they're ready for a full cup. Somebody else is ready to fill their barrel. They want a full set of Bhagavatams. And, and, and we, we're the servants, we're not the controllers. So we're, we're, we're just trying to give a little bit of Krishna wherever we can. If someone can take more, we're ready to give them everything we, everything we can share in our hearts and their Guru's given us, but we can't judge. You know, he has to be at this level, she has to be at that level. That's what causes obstacles, and that causes a lot of tension among ourselves and with other people, and, and, and with the outside world, you know, it, it can be, uh, we, we can hurt our, our reputation and our relationships with people. That's, uh, that's beautiful. So I'll just take one by one, you, you spoke a lot of points. I like the starting metaphor which you made of, you know, that there can be different levels at which people may practice. So I was thinking it could be like a ladder. Last time we discussed about a pyramid. So our point is that we want to take people from one step up from where they are. So a standard, you use the word snapshot. So it's, it's a beautiful point that sometimes we may equate a person with their present level. And then by, in a sense, reducing them to that level, we may judge and deride them. So, but if we see that it's a progression and this is where the person is, let's see how I can help them move forward one step. So I like the word, so a standard is like a snapshot and we could say, like a ladder has different rungs. So whichever is the rung that that person is most comfortably situated on, we help them get there. Okay, you, you are at this rung, this is good. If you can come one step up, that's also good. So that was one point. Another point, there is this, uh, I sometimes talk about this concept of digital and analog conceptions of bhakti. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is digital is, we, it's like one or zero. It's either you have to take the complete package or you get out of here. Or, so is but like what you explained, it's amazing that in Denver you mentioned that somebody who's an atheist can come and also experience Krishna or experience something. And uh, that also indicates the broadness of the temple. So, so if people want to just take one or two things, then we let them take that and let them stay connected in that way at least. So and, and, and encourage them. Encourage them in that way. Just like if you have a child, you know, you have one child and they, they, they show some inclination towards music. You know, the parent encourages them. The parent should encourage them in that way. Some, some other child, they're sitting, they're drawing, and, you know, compared to what an adult can do, it's, it's completely useless. <laughs> but yeah. they're, it's wonderful. And if you encourage them, they feel some sense of, uh, of self-worth. And it's all about self-worth. I mean, we're all about helping us reconnect with Krishna because Prabhupada says we're, you know, in one sense we're worthless. We have no value until we connect with Krishna. So we're looking for that. So yes. encourage people, that whatever, whatever, you know, they love to sing, great, sing for Krishna. Somebody doesn't like to sing, great, wash pots for Krishna, etc. Yes, truly. But this approach of, you know, gradual elevation, like last time I mentioned how Kalakan Prabhupada said that we have frozen uh, our conception of Prabhupada and Iskon in the 1970s instead of 1960s. So another way I felt is that our conception of Prabhupada and Iskon is more based on the way it was the model that was of preaching that was there in the early days in the West, where people just moved into the temple. In India, practically nobody moved into the temple, and still Prabhupada was very warm and encouraging and appreciative of those who supported him, who became life members. So Prabhupada was not necessarily in term, not always this one zero kind of thing. Prabhupada wanted everybody to take as much as they could, but if they couldn't, then whatever level they were engaging, he was appreciative of that. And even sometimes in those early days, I was, again, I mentioned last time, rereading the Lila Mrita, and there was one or two young devotees, and they were saying to Prabhupada, I want to advance quicker, I want to advance quicker. And Prapa was mentioned in his, in his lectures that I, I told Robert he has to be patient. It, has, it takes some patience. So yeah. that's there too. It, and, and, and again, we have to be really careful. We don't judge people according to ourselves. In other words, let's say for me, I love to have these kind of conversations. I really like to meet people. 
Um, I'm not so good. I, I don't deity worship in the past, but I'm kind of a little maybe hyperactive kind of a person. The idea for me, if my main service was to do four arctics a day, I'm not meditative enough. I'm not Krishna conscious enough, perhaps, to do that service. That would be wrong for me. I just, I just, I wouldn't be happy to have a very difficult time, just as an example. If someone told me that's the only way to express my Krishna consciousness, that, that would really be uh, one, unfair, untrue, unkind, and it, it would be an obstacle in my spiritual life. So I can do some deity worship, but that can't be my main service. And someone else, again, has a propensity in a different kind of way. Some people we know, like a lot of times we see with some of the younger generations, they see like teenagers and you know, some, sometimes, not all teenagers, but some, you know, they kind of like to hang around the temple and maybe they'll do a little bit of service and, you know, it's like they don't really want to hear the lecture. But when it's time for kirtan, they get together with some of their friends. They, they all have, you know, eight-hour kirtans, 20-hour kirtans, two-day kirtans, stay up all night long kirtans. They love chanting. And we see that a lot of our younger people. Um, so we can either choose to stand around and say, well, you know, they chant, but they don't do any service, or they like kirtan, why don't they chant japa, or it's, et cetera. Or, you know, or, you know, look, it's boys and girls sitting in the same room. This is nonsense. We, we can think like that, or we can think well, how wonderful it is they're attracted to Krishna's name. How can we encourage them? How can we show them support? And, of course, gradually help them take up some of the other aspects in, in Krishna consciousness. But, uh, you know, they say, I was reading something not too long ago about like, you know, parenting kind of a guide. And they were talking about how, I don't know how the system works in India, but in the U.S., at least when I was a kid, you know, you get your grades from your different classes. You get an A or B or C or D or like that, sometimes pluses and minuses in between. Mm -hmm. so, and they were talking about typically, you know, the, the child comes home and shows their, their parents their grades. A, 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 B minus, A, A. And many times the parents look at them and they go, what's this B all about? Why did you get a B? You're smarter than that. Didn't you apply yourself? I told you you should have done more homework, et cetera, et cetera. So they focus on the negative. They focus on, you know, rather than saying, oh, my God, this is one, five A's. How in the world did you do this? I'm so grateful. Let's go out and get some ice cream, you know, something, you know, I'm so, I'm, I'm, this was fantastic. I'm going to call your grandmother and tell her. And you reinforce that sense, again, that sense of self-worth, that sense of, of being appreciated. <clears throat> the child knows they didn't get a B. The parent doesn't have to mention that, that they got a B. The, the, the parent doesn't have to say, what's with this B? The student knows I got a B. If I get this much appreciation for five A's, Krishna, Krishna, well, how much appreciation and love and for my family am I going to get if I get six A's next time? So they'll motivate themselves. But if the parent just focuses on the one B or the C or the D, whatever it is, that, that actually is, is not productive. It's not helpful. So in the same way in Krishna consciousness, and I'll just give a simple example. I don't think I told this before. When I was a brand new bhakta, I remember uh, coming to India on the bank of the Ganga in Mayapur after taking bath and trying, struggling to put on tilak with, with Ganges mud. And Lokanath Swami happened to be there. And I was a new bhakta, and he, of course, was a sannyasi. I mean, now we, we, we do some seva together by his grace. He lets me do some service with him by Prabhupada's grace. But in those days, he was a big, big sannyasi. I just, the first time in India, and I'm trying to put on my tilak. And he just was nearby, and he looked at me, and he said, Oh, you are putting on your tilak the way Srila Bhakti Sananta Saraswati Thakur did, without a mirror. This is very nice. And just... <laughs> okay. Nobody. I'm just, you know, there was probably I don't know, 500 devotees. I'm, I'm a nobody, just some skinny kid from America. But he reached out and he said that thing to me, an insignificant thing about how I was putting tilak on. And it has such an effect on me. It really inspired me. And I, I felt cared for. I felt, oh, you know, I should try to do it even better. Like that, you, you feel motivated by the positive reinforcement. And, you know, so much so that I probably told the story, you know, 50 times because it really affected me. And, and, and I, I think that that's what Krishna consciousness is all about, is, is just being kind of vessels of Krishna's kindness and Prabhupada's kindness and Guru's kindness and Lord Chaitanya's mood, and wherever we see that little spark fanning it. That's beautiful. So encouraging is very important because everybody is also a volunteer. You know, with respect to studies or profession, you could say there is some obligation at one level, I have to do my job, I have to take care of my family. But in many ways, devotion is entirely voluntary. 
So if there's no encouragement, then people can very easily go. Thank you for sharing that experience also. So just one point about this, there's encouraging and there's judging. So at one level, you said we shouldn't judge. Uh, but isn't it a characteristic of the Kanishta Adhikari to judge? This person is a devotee. Let me befriend them. This person is innocent. Let me share Krishna Bhakti with them. This person is envious. Let me keep a distance from them. So isn't that a form of judging? Let me, let me, I'm not sure if I heard you clearly. You said, so Kanishta Adhikari, he sees this person is... is, is Madhya Madhikari, sorry. Madhya Madhikari. So, so, yeah, Madhya Madhikari. Sorry. So he sees this person as a devotee. Uh, let, let me criticize and be jealous of them. And he sees this person as innocent. Let me think down upon them and understand that they're untouchable people and I should uh, keep my distance entirely. But w was, that, was that how the, the Shastra plays it? Oh, God. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So, so we could say that there is we a certain... Say, we see Krishna and his representatives and, and we, you know, we bow down to, to the Lord and we, we render service and we hear from those more advanced. We make friends with those who are peers, fellow devotees. And if you're a friend, it means you care about somebody and you, you sacrifice for them and you serve them. And you try to help them. And then they see the innocent people. We try to lift them up, not push them down in our mind or in our words, but try to lift them up. And then if there's people that are really inimical, okay, we avoid them. It doesn't say we curse them. It doesn't say we condemn them. It's, we, we avoid them. We avoid those people. Yes. So now this is a good point that so there is a certain amount of we could say discerning, but it should not be from a holier than thou attitude. So well, yes, exactly. Okay, that's a good point. Now this is a, a slightly different situation. Like say, if we are thinking how to engage people so that they can be encouraged to come toward Krishna. But if there's a slightly different setting where we are going to people who are doing certain things. Say, for example, there's a family festival, uh, like a family traditional religious festival. So uh, I would like to ask you, say, uh, if I may ask, you are from a Jew background or a Christian background or what? I, I, I describe it as a non-practicing Christian background. Okay. So I, me... I, I went to church with my family, like maybe till I was about five years old. Okay. And then later, just for some, they have what they call in the West summer camps. You know, your kid goes someplace and you go on canoeing and swimming and things like that. That was run by a church. But otherwise, that was pretty much my, my whole exposure. Oh, Okay. So say, but suppose if you had some family friends and they are celebrating Christmas. So even before you started your interfaith initiative, would you have, if they invited you, would you have any hesitation of going there and participating in that? If it was yeah. a family? Actually, it's interesting. I don't remember the exact chronology, but as a brand new devotee, a bhakta in the West that was starting to understand that much of my activities before I was a devotee were very materialistic and, and sinful and counterproductive to my spiritual upliftment. And I had a lot of habits that I was, was working my way through. The first year or two, and I don't remember exactly, um, I didn't go home. I didn't visit my family. I lived a ways away. I wrote letters. I called them now and then. I didn't cut them off by any means, but, but I didn't go back. But then when I was a little stronger, I think after I got initiated, so maybe it was about a year later, I started visiting at, at holidays and things like that, especially Christmas, because my family was kind of a, they celebrated Christmas, but they didn't do so in a religious way. But it was a big deal for them to have everybody come together. Okay. So, you know, I would go back and I'd spend, I'd spend a few days uh, with them. And uh, yeah, I think as most of these do. Oh, okay. So in that sense... Even if it is not explicitly a religious occasion, it's a social occasion. It's a family occasion. So going forward with this, uh, if we take at an individual level, there are different kinds of engagements. And um, if somebody has a close family member or relative who is, uh, who, who is following an impersonalist path or who is following a, 
uh, who is atheistic so how much should how should a devotee deal with that say for example if we give them a book to read they may give us an atheistic book to read or they may ask us i'll read this book you read this book so so how much should one try to engage with somebody like that any thoughts on that again from my recent rereading of the lila mrita when Prabhupada first came to America, he was with uh, Sally Agarwal. Yes. Living in her home. And I mentioned this last time. You know, he came there one time a little early and she said, Swamiji, we haven't cleaned up yet. The smell of meat must be very disturbing. Prabhupada said, think nothing of it. Time, place, and circumstance. These people were his host. He wanted to be respectful. And they were inviting people to their home. People were coming to their home to hear about Krishna. This lady took him to all the newspapers to try to get some media coverage. She took him all the way, to, I think, to Pittsburgh, which was, I don't know, an hour drive, perhaps, something like that. They didn't think it was newsworthy. But then she brought him back to the local paper. And that's that first famous article, Prabhupada's picture in the Butler Eagle, uh, about yes. this, you know, Swami coming. That, that, was, that, was, that was Sally Akawal did that. And she arranged so many things. They told him how to, when he goes to New York, how to use the subway. She took him to the grocery store so we can learn and understand how Americans live. So many services she rendered. So Prophet accepted those services, and he didn't criticize her unnecessarily. It wasn't appropriate. And 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 Prophet, there's a picture of Prophet when her son was first standing. There's a picture of Prophet, this huge smile on his face. He's with this lady who's got a baby, and, and, and she's enjoying that her son is learning to stand. So for time, place, and circumstance, you know, Prabhupada was with them, and he was respectful. He understood what was important to them. And, and he was a Krishna-conscious person. You know, Prabhupada said we should be perfect ladies and gentlemen. He was a perfect gentleman. I'm a guest in their home. I treat the family members with respect. Um, and then later, Prabhupada went to New York, and he was staying in this ashram of Dr. Mishra. Dr. Mishra was a complete Mayavadi. He was an impersonalist, and, and he would let Prabhupada chant sometimes, but rarely would he let Prabhupada talk. They were philosophical adversaries. And at the same time, he was Prabhupada's host. Prabhupada used to cook for him. And there's beautiful, beautiful expressions of appreciation from Dr. Mishra that are in the Leelamrita about how Swamiji brought me back to health. And he says things like his, you know, prasadam was just glorious, and he speaks very flowery words. But Prabhupada sometimes was sitting back with his charter up, listening, you know, waiting for this lecture to end, and then they would ask him to do kirtan. So according to the circumstances, and Prabhupada certainly wasn't completely happy. He, he, he tried to get to some place he did as quickly as possible. But in the meantime, he, he did the best he could. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to be a similar situation. Maybe we go home in our family, and we know so many devotees. The mother becomes a devotee. The father becomes a devotee. The sister becomes a devotee. But we don't all have that kind of a situation. So, you know, any kind of, I think, I think the main point is any kind of relationship we have, we should try to make it as Krishna conscious or as spiritual or as sattvic or at least as respectful as possible. Yeah. Depending on the opportunity, again, like fill that vessel. So the person who's got an atheistic family member, you know, you can go home and you can get in a big fight with them and disturb everybody uh, and, and, and all of that. And, and everybody just walks away thinking these Christian people are just angry and bitter and, and, and you know, self-absorbed. Or you can go and be a little respectful and maybe avoid the things you don't agree upon. And maybe there's a niece or a nephew there that are really thinking, well, I, I like what uncle or auntie so-and-so said. And, you know, and then they, and they hear and they learn and they appreciate how nice you are. Maybe about the atheistic person, perhaps some, some atheists are quite gentlemanly, but you know, by your other ways of preaching, they're attracted, you know, and, and, and of course, depending on the situation, almost all of us, I would think, especially in India, we can bring prashadam, Christian prashadam, and they'll appreciate that. I know I used to go home and, you know, my, my family were not vegetarian. And they would sometimes, you know, they would cook their stuff. I tried to get, I'd say, my mother, look, I can make the main dish. I can do this. I can do that. And I would cook a whole lot of stuff and share that. But, uh, you know, until the very end of their lives, you know, nobody really became a vegetarian in my family. But I still gave them as much Christian prasadam as I could. Okay. So, you know, there are some points which are uh, for devotees, like say, somebody taking meat. Sometimes there's a, of course, in, I think in the West it is different because almost everybody takes meat as a part of their meal. But 
that sometimes becomes like a very strong judgmental issue. It's like, it's almost like, I don't want to have anything to do with you if, if you are eating meat. So there are two distinct things. One is there could be ideological differences and there could be with respect to culture or practices. That person might believe something which is radically different from what we believe or that person might uh, practice something which is contrary to what we practice. So if I hear you right, what you're saying is that don't make a big issue out of it. Just see how you can relate with them in a cordial way and move forward. I mean, for us, it's a big issue. You give the example of meeting. I mean, it's disgusting. It's horrible. You know, you, 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 even you, you, you look at the simple book, A Higher Taste. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for our bodies. It's, it's bad for the food supply. Uh, it's bad for our karma. You know, it's, it's horribly painful for the animals. There's a whole industry based around raising and slaughtering and, 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 and consuming and pushing people into a meat diet. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. And, you know, as Jesus said in the Bible, hate the sin, not the sinner. So if we allow ourselves to hate the sinner... In other words, if we, be, if, 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 if we, if we say, okay, I, I, I'll have nothing to do with this person, whether they're a family member or someone at work or someone we meet, because they do this sinful thing, well, where, where's Lord Chaitanya's movement? I mean, if I remember correctly, I mean, I think Lord Chaitanya said everyone can join him on the street as long as they're following the four regulated principles and chanting 16 rounds, right? That's what he said. Lord God. Right? I remember correctly when the Chan Kazi made a big deal, Lord Chaitanya refused to see him because he was a, a you know, because he was a Muslim. And if I remember correctly, Haridas Thakur was rejected because he was born in a Muslim family. And if I remember that the six Goswamis are a figment of our imagination because uh, certainly Lord Chaitanya never had anything to do with people that associated so closely with, with meat eaters and fallen people. Right? I mean, and the whole mood of, of Mahaprabhu's movement, for ourselves, I mean, I mean, certainly Prabhupada, I mean, imagine, Prabhupada just came from Vindavan. We may think, oh, you know, <clears throat> you know, I've been a devotee, maybe a, a lot of us come from families that weren't vegetarians, so now, you know, we know meat's a horrible thing. Uh, Prabhupada just came from Vrindavan. He a lifelong vegetarian, eating only Krishna Prasadam, came directly from Vrindavan, went to speak of his spiritual consciousness, and we can't even try to understand his, his spiritual consciousness. And he lands in Butler, Pennsylvania, and the place he's got to stay in his house, they eat meat. And, you know, I mean, they're like the kitchen sink's full of chicken bones. I mean, how disgusting is that? But Prabhupada focused on his mission. He had a deeper purpose in mind. And, and with Dr. Misha, how disgusting. He's got to be, in one sense, you know, be with this person who's an offender. It's disgusting in the sense he's offended or Krishna. You know, Krishna's not real. Krishna doesn't have a face. Krishna doesn't have a... a a consort, you know, the spiritual world is illusion. All of those things that are really philosophically very difficult for us. We're, we're offended by those. But for the sake of preaching, for the sake of being compassionate, you know, we, 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 uh, we look beyond those as Prabhupada did. Again, looking at uh, Prabhupada, the early history and continued Prabhupada's mood uh, in New York City. So many people were coming, so many kind of crazy people, people with drugs, and certainly all were eating meat almost. And, uh, you know, boys and girls missing illicit, mixing illicitly. But Prabhupada saw beyond that. He saw the, the, the spirit soul. i tell you a quick funny story. I, I just read yesterday. <clears throat> Brahman Underpur, when he was first becoming a devotee, Bruce, big, big guy, he'd been to India. And it mentions in the Lila Marita, he had a, a girlfriend of some sort. Doesn't get into details. How did he do that? He's in America. She's in India. But anyway, he had a girlfriend. He still had her picture. So he mentioned to Prabhupada, I've been to India, and among things he mentioned, I have a girlfriend in India. Prabhupada said, oh, let me see her picture. Or he said, I have a picture. Well, Prabhupada said, let me see. So he showed Prabhupada the picture. Prabhupada looked, he said, oh, she's not very pretty. Most Indian girls are much more beautiful than she is. That was Prabhupada's response. <laughs> and Prabhupada says, you know, at that point, Prabhupada, he said, she kind of like broke my attachment to this girl. Even Prabhupada doesn't think she's pretty. He said, I don't know if I ever looked at that picture again. So, <laughs> I mean, Prabhupada could have said so many things. You know, it's just, it's, just, it's just amazing. You know, he didn't say to him, oh, girlfriends are nonsense and this and that. Mukunda and, John, and, 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 and John, Janaki, Prabhupada initiated them, uh, and they weren't even married yet. 
They came back the next day and they said, Swami, can we talk to you? And he said, yes. They said, well, you know, now we're initiated. He said, yes. They said, we're thinking we should, uh, you know, is, is there love? I think they actually asked, is there love in Krishna consciousness? And Prabhupada said, I think you're asking you want to get married. I'm paraphrasing. They said, yes. Well, then Prabhupada, the whole, this whole, the second yoga in this kind of history, the first one was initiation. The second one was Mukund and Janaki's wedding. Hmm. Explaining them, you got to go buy a red sari, and you got to bring your family members, and that whole beautiful exchange with Joan, who later became Jamuna, about how to cook a big, big feast, and Prabhupada did this amazing feast. He's a sannyasi, but he knew I'm transplanting a whole culture. Part of the culture is marriage. Marriage is a sacred vow. It's the foundation of, of society, you know, family life, and all of that. So he made a big deal out of it because he knew it was a big deal for his disciples. He knew it was going to be a big deal for Iskon. So he didn't judge, you know, I'm a sannyasi, the goal is to be renounced. It's like, no, where you are, you're young people. Most young people need to be married. Their relationship's going to be stronger if they have a community and a culture that supports them. And if we make this a big ceremony, and uh, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Mm. This is an example of, uh, if I understand what you're saying is, that we have to look at people at their level and see what raises them up. And Prabhupada would do something which is radically different from what a traditional sannyasi would do for that purpose. Because he knew the purpose. He knew the purpose. Yeah. And what's the system? We can say, well, the standard is your sannyasi. You shouldn't be doing these kind of things. And Prabhupada even writes about it purport in his Bhagavad Gita. He probably talked about it in some lectures too. You know, sometimes people criticize it's not appropriate for sannyasi. And he said, this is, the, this is important for, he, he uses the term, uh, a, a man in an immature stage, a young man. You know, for most of them, some are, 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 are re, more renounced as you are, you know, Brahmacharya Ashram, but not, most people don't do that. They're going to want to get married. <clears throat> so that's the appropriate thing. So should a sannyasi engage in this? Generally, no, a sannyasi should be, you know, a little aloof from these things. But what's the real purpose of sannyas? To preach, to teach, to help people come to Krishna. So if, 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 as the founder of our movement, he did what was necessary to help everybody, whatever level they're at, to, to, make, some, to make some advancement. Yes. So, Prabhu, with, this, with respect to engaging, there is a, I just thought of one question. There is sometimes a, a demonization of the modern world. And we could say almost... A, romanticization of the traditional way of living or you could say almost a rural way of living mm. and uh, we could say certainly that at one level uh, the a modern urbanized way of living is uh, it, it demands a lot of energy and it provides a lot of distractions at the same time realistically speaking most devotees their jobs their careers are in the cities so how do you see this kind of engaging with the world in terms of, uh, say, where we live and how much we participate in our professions or our, in our social situations? Let's say I'm a doctor and you come to me and, you, and, and we do some tests and you have low blood pressure. And I say, well, you have low blood pressure. You need a medication that's going to raise your blood pressure. I don't particularly like that medicine. I'm only going to give you medicine that's going to lower your blood pressure more. What kind of doctor? Okay. Or you come, you come to see me and I do a little analysis and I realize you have kidney problems. But I say, you know, I prefer to work with heart patients. So I, I'll schedule you for open heart surgery. You don't really need it, but I'm going to give you heart oh, surgery. God. <laughs> that's what I like. Okay. What kind of doctor am I? I'm not a doctor. I'm a selfish kind of a medical exploiter, isn't it? So yeah. the same, you know, I, I, I think that it's interesting because you look at Prabhupada, because as you're asking the question, two things came in my mind. One is Prabhupada said our duty is to go to the cities, right? And Pallad Maharaj talked about that, right? That, you know, there's many saintly people that they go to and they live into the forest to cultivate their own spiritual life. But, I, you know, Prabhupada comes, Vaishnavas, we go to the cities. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was right there in Calcutta, and he went to places. Prabhupada went to New York, wanting to go to the Himalayas. He went to New York, and then he went to L.A., 
And then he went to Montreal. And then he sent disciples to London. He went to where the people were. <laughs> At the same time, in his seven purposes, again, I've got it, I moved it because I was in another interview yesterday, but I, I have a posted usually on my wall. One of his purposes, I think it's number six, to promote five or six, to promote a simpler, more natural way of life. And Prabhupada went to New Vrindavan. He spent weeks at a time in New Vrindavan. He visited Gita Nagari and he wanted, you know, he wanted to see these natural places. And, and he talked about in the future, the society, to use modern terms, is not so sustainable. So he went to the cities. He told us we should preach in the cities. And at the same time, he wanted to demonstrate an alternative. So I, I don't think... I don't think we should either romanticize or demonize. Um, I think we should, you're so good at all these terms, you'll come up with a nice term, something like, you know, practicalize or something. Utilize. Like utilize, there you go. We ut utilize. So, um, you know, some, some, some people, they live in the cities, and, and, and we have to be there to try to uplift them and show them how to, to, to live a Krishna conscious life. And like these days with the whole COVID-19, I was just walking in a, just yesterday took a, took a walk. I was walking down some, some new kind of a downtown area in a, in a development near where I live. So many empty stores and apartments up, up, up top. And this was kind of like the new trend in, in, in building because a lot of people now in, in my generation, before me, my parents in America, everybody wanted to move to what they call the suburbs. They wanted to get out and have a little grass and have a lawn and have a garage and that it kind of, I mean, a lot of people, many, many people still live like that, but it's a little less popular. The, the trend had been kind of, no, we want to stay downtown, be in the city. You know, you live upstairs, like, like in an urban environment. You know, you come downstairs and there's, there's the, the grocery store and there's the neighbors and everything's condensed. So there, all this new, a lot of new construction now is building those urban environments until COVID-19. And now it's like, oh, I don't want to be next to people. I don't want to have to go downstairs with a mask and I can't walk outside without seeing a, a hundred people or a thousand people. So, the, you know, the material world is like forcing people here or there. Or but, but for devotees, if people are in the country, we want to be in the country. And, of course, we want to show them that simpler lifestyle. But people in the cities, we go to the cities. And some of us may be really inclined. Some, some devotees, they come to Krishna conscious immediately. They say, I want to give my life to help develop Govardhan Nico Village. Or I want to go, I, I want to, you know, be in New Vrindavan. I want to milk the cows. I want to be out there. I want to, I want to, you know, grow hay. And that's, that's how I want to serve Krishna. And other people, it's different. They, they, they work. So according to what comes natural to us and according to the need, but I don't, I don't think we should romanticize one or demonize another. You know, ultimately in one sense, this is where Krishna consciousness is so <laughs> profound and wonderful. And one says it's all rotten. The whole material world is rotten. Everything's rotten. The mode of goodness is rotten. The mode of passion is rotten. The mode of, it's all maya. It's all lower energy. But in the other sense, it's all good because it's the creation of Krishna to help the living entities reconnect with him. Mm. And even the mode of passion, you know, it's like nectar in the beginning, the Gita says, and like poison at the end. Even that is good because the person that's starting to taste the horrible e effects of their materialistic, sometimes sinful activity, that's also good because Krishna's arranged a system that they learn. Oh, that, you know, you touch the fire, you get burned. So is getting burned good or is it bad? In one sense, it's terrible. The soul is supposed to be perfectly is pure and happy. Satchitananda, why the soul suffering? It's horrible that the soul suffering at the same time. If that suffering is helping that conditioned soul realize I'm missing something, I'm in the wrong place, is there a higher purpose? Why am I suffering? Then it's good. So in the same way, you know, the countryside is very good. But, you know, if you move to the country, you get attached to the trees and this and that, you come back as a tree, what good is that? <laughs> right? Oh. Or if you, live, if you live in the city, and you know, and which, which is a place of a passion and ignorance, it's not a good place. If you get enamored by that and you get bewildered by that, well, then, you know, that's terrible. But if, if in that place you, you, you share Krishna consciousness with so many people, 26 Second Avenue, our home, the home, today's Incorporation Day, uh, today or tomorrow, depending on the calendar, where did Providence incorporate? 26 Second Avenue. You read those histories, trucks driving by and noise and children and dogs and so many distractions, a funeral parlor across the street. <laughs> it was a really lower mode of nature 
But that's where Krishna consciousness took off because Prabhupada made it transcendental. So nothing really is romantic, nothing in one sense. In one sense, nothing really is demoniac, you know, in the sense that uh, we shouldn't think something is, is beyond the reach of Krishna consciousness. I mean, the Shastra says devotee will go to heaven, they'll go to hell. It doesn't matter to them as long as they can serve Krishna. Yeah. This is a very good point that we, most of our vibrant centers are even now in the urban places. That's where we are reaching out. So there is this idea that bhakti is sometimes seen as anti-modern, that modernity is bad and bhakti is to go against the stream of modernity. Now, earlier I used to often in my talks, maybe 10 years ago, I often talk about the polarization between say Indian culture and Western culture. But now after I have spent some time in the West, I maybe have modified that polarization, if at all. I talk about more of materialistic culture and spiritual culture. So it's, you could say modernity maybe is more materialistic than in the past. But modernity also has its, its sattva, has its, its spirituality. So how much do you think bhakti has to be see, One reason why devotees hesitate to engage with the world is that they see the world as maya that this is Kali Yuga and the whole world is filled with illusion. So that often leads to the idea that it's, it's a hostile place. And the, the current of bhakti is meant to go in an opposite direction from the way the current of the modernity is going. But then we could also say that it was not that in tradition, the current was always going toward bhakti. There also it could go toward some mundane religiosity, there also it could go to so many other directions. So any thoughts on this, Prabhu? Yes, you, you asked wonderful questions. Again, just rereading Lila Amrita, Prabhupada took some of his young devotee followers, I think it's before the initiation. He went, Dr. Mishra had some kind of ashram out in the country outside of New York City. And they went there and they made prasadam. And some of Mishra's people were there too. They had a big, big kirtan, joyful kirtan. And uh, one of the devotees or some of them were on a morning walk with Prabhupada or maybe evening. They were watching the sun go down or the sunrise. And someone commented to Prabhupada, isn't the sunset beautiful or the sunrise beautiful? And Prabhupada said, we're not so much interested in the beauty of the sun sign or the sunrise. We're interested in the beautiful person who made the sun rise. Hmm. So, you know, when you say uh, bhakti is anti-modern, I, I disagree with that. I think bhakti is anti-maya. That's what bhakti is. We're anti-maya. You know, someone I know in my early days, my sense was bhakti was, was anti-grahasta. You know, grahasta ashram for the first, I came in 75, so at least for the first five, ten years after that, maybe longer. You know, we used to, you don't hear it at all these days, I hope, nowhere, but maybe a few pockets. It was ridiculous and wrong and, 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 and hurtful. And someone's getting married, the term of the day was fall down. Well, they get married, they're falling down. Like for a brahmachari to get married to a nice Vaishnavi and a Krishna conscious environment and, and, and to, to, you know, to take vows, to take care of each other and to serve Krishna and to, to raise Krishna conscious children, that that was a fall down. Rather than seeing, no, this is actually for most people. You know, again, if one can, is able to stay in a renounced sort of life, that's, 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 that's perfect. Probably said that's best. But most people can't do that. And therefore, going from what really for most is, is more a student life into making a, you know, a commitment as a grahasta and be responsible man and woman and, and all the things that it entails and continuing and serving Krishna. That's a, that's a move in the, in the right direction. But... You know, if we're, if we're thinking, though, we're anti-grahasta, or we're anti-modern, or we're anti-this, or anti-anti-West, okay, we're anti-West. Well, why did Prabhupada come to the West? And you, and you say anti-modern, um, I'm just sitting here watching you on the screen. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that those uh, thoughtful people in the 16th century, uh, at the time of Lord Jaitanya, invented Zoom and invented computers and invented the internet so that we could use those traditional things to have this wonderful conversation with each other. Because otherwise, if they hadn't invented those things long ago, we certainly have to reject them because we know we're anti-modern. 
you see the kind of ridiculous mm-hmm. thing again, you know, we're anti-modern. And, and, and Prabhupada was asked that in many, many different contexts. You know, you criticize the material world, but you're using a, a, a microphone, you're using airplanes. And Prabhupada said, we don't reject these things. We reject the materialistic mentality that these things are meant for my, meant for my selfish, sensual enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Right? The whole Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says, Krishna, I reject. I'm anti-war. I'm anti-politics. I'm anti running the kingdom. I'm anti uh, using strength for anything other than just what, what, what makes me happy. I, I, I'm anti this. Yeah. And I just, and it, it probably came to New York in the middle of Vietnam War and he's reading from the Bhagavad Gita and they're challenging him. So what do you think about Vietnam War? He probably said it's not the Vietnam War. They're, they're always going to be worse. The principle behind it. So the principle is not anti-modern or anti-traditional, this and that, <laughs> anti-West. India is the home of Vedic culture, and for those of us that live there, visited there, a lot of contaminated stuff in India these days. A lot of contaminated stuff. You know, it's not, you know, the pure Vedic culture is not in India these days. But there's a lot of very strong things that are there coming from the Vedic culture, the Vaishnav culture. And the same thing when you go to the West, there's a lot of nonsense going on in the West, but there's a lot of good things. You know, a lot of very, very good things. So, so Prabhupada, you know, we, we should, we, Johnny Kapanik probably would quote, you take gold even from a filthy place. So, mm-hmm. you know, if we can, I, I heard Prabhupada said one time, something to this effect that my, my, in my, within my movement, like the culture is Indian and my management is American or Western or modern, you know, whatever term you might like. So take, take the best from everywhere. You know, and in some ways, you know, if India, as it seems to be doing in many ways, develops better management systems than they had in the West, well, we'll take those for Krishna. You know, and if America learns to become more environmentally conscious and better at promoting a simpler, more natural way of life, which is our purpose given by profit, we'll take, you know, maybe India is just building high rises and destroying the environment. I'm just giving a hypothetical. Yeah. And we're going to take the good from the West, you know, and, and Prabhupada, he went to Russia. It's an atheistic place. But he, but he came away and he wrote an Isha Upanishad and talked about this other places. We're promoting spiritual communism. Yes. From each according to their ability, to each according to their need, but with Krishna in the center. Yeah. So we're anti-Maya. Okay. And we're pro- anti-Maya. And- anti-Maya. We're, not even, we're not even anti-Maya because we know Maya has a purpose. We're pro-Krishna. That's what we are. Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. And I like this. You know, we could say we were anti grahastha before and so many other things like that. So just uh, moving forward, with respect to Yukta Vairagya, that's a very uh, well-established principle. And Prabhupada also talked about the East-West synthesis, the blind man, the lame man. The, but when you talk about modernity, there are certain things, say, for example, the fast-paced, demanding lifestyle, where people often spend more time at their workplace than at their homes or for their spiritual life. And there is also a constant glamorization of material things. There is a, there is a, you could say abundance or surfeit of entertainment and triviality that way. So we could say that there are certain things at one level, I, I recently started studying a little bit of the history of India. So I found that some, sometimes some devotees would speak that in the past, if, if you were living as far, if people lived in farming, they just did some irrigation for three, four months a year and they had enough grains for the, for the whole year. And that was how it was. But now we have to work throughout the year. But I realized it's not that simple because if there are droughts and there are famines and then it could be sometimes just to get one bucket of water, one may have to go a long distance away. So it's, and, uh, so it's not necessary that life, is, uh, life was, say, easier in the past and it's tougher now. Life is maybe, we could say, more complicated now. And life was a little simpler in the past. But simpler does not necessarily mean easier and complicated does not necessarily mean tougher. In many ways, in today's times, our basic needs are provided for much more easily. 
like say some devotees who go and start living in the rural settings, they realize that you know, to just without electricity, without flowing water, every small thing takes time. So in that sense, uh, I don't know whether, whether even, although we could say modernity is fast paced and other things and very demanding, but that criticism also has to be contextualized in the whole of history, not just in selective readings of history. Any thoughts on this? And I think it goes back again to seeing that um, <clears throat> you know it's not so much modern and and antiquity and all of that. It, it it's God centered and not God centered. That's kind of like the underlying. That's the foundation. That's the theme. That's the stream that that we run through. <clears throat> so you've got. I mean, you look look at Chaitanya and Charitamrita, and I, I, I'm not so well studied, but you have the example of certain devotees that were fabulously wealthy, and people criticized them, but then they were exalted devotees of, of Krishna. Kundarik Vidyanidhi was. the classic example. Yeah. And then you have, then you have other devotees. What that was the devotee that just made, uh, made banana leaf pots or clay Kola pots? Yeah. So totally poverty-stricken. <clears throat> But, but exalted soul. Then you have the example of, of great, great, great scholars, you know, the six Goswamis and Jiva Goswami. I think over time it, around the world, people are going to start hearing and learning more about what, what a phenomenal scholar, even from the material context. You know, he wrote so many books and so, such, such deep, deep thought. <clears throat> and then you have the example of the illiterate Brahmin that Lord Chaitanya came across, I think, in South India who was reading the Gita, trying every day, although he couldn't read. And Lord Chaitanya told him, you've understood the Gita. As he explained how he's crying, tears come to his eyes, because when he tries to read, his, his meditation is how Krishna's become the chariot driver of Arjuna, and he can't withhold the, he can't withhold the tears. So again, I think, I think that that's, that same principle is there, that uh, there are a lot of negative aspects to modernity. Um, I mean, again, COVID-19, I mean, that's a product somehow of the global environment. And, you know, it's this thing started in China and it's spread all around the world. And, <clears throat> you know, people huddled together in the, in the cities. If everybody lived on a farm, your closest neighbor was 100 meters or, or, or a mile away. Who, how would this be spreading? It wouldn't be spreading. It'd be too isolated. But because we're so cramped together, so modernity is kind of a concomitant factor, this horrible disease. <clears throat> and you and I... It, because of this terrible situation, you and I are having this conversation on Zoom. Yes. So, I remember I asked one, I asked Mukunda Maharaj, I said, Maharaj, uh, one time something was going on and, and we lived together in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years and he moved to Australia after I'd moved from Denver to, to Washington to be with him to work in communications. And I asked him one time, I said, Maharaj, how do you maintain your determination in, in the midst of so many kind of obstacles that sometimes come up in Christian consciousness? And he told me he asked a similar thing of Prabhupada one time, or maybe Prabhupada just gave this example, that uh, just like a person, and just see the modern example that Prabhupada's given. He said, just like the stockbroker, the man that buys and sells shares of stocks, when the market's going up, he's making money. When the market's going down, he's making money. So... When we're successful, we're devoting everything to Krishna. When there seems to be no external success, we're still dedicating everything to Krishna. When we're in a very modern materialistic environment, or maybe we have a, a nature that, that that's the kind of environment that, that we're in, it's a destiny to one, one extent or the other, it's our situation, we do it for Krishna. If we're if we're in, in, in you know, if suddenly that disappears and tomorrow there's no more electricity on the planet. Life doesn't come to an end. We still, we do everything for Christian. For a lot of people, life would come to an end. How can I live without electricity? But for devotees, I know for me, it would be an awfully big challenge. But at least I would do my best to understand I can still serve Krishna. Maybe I can't read at night, but I can read when the sun comes up, etc. Hmm. These are beautiful examples. So, basically... Everything we could say in the material world has good and bad, and we just take the good. And uh, 
it's so another example i i give is that bhakti is not about turning back the clock it is more about we could say turning on our compass the turning on a spiritual compass within us of how can i go toward krishna from here or how can i go uh, how can i help others move toward krishna so to engaging with technology is something which is prabhupada did that and we are doing it now how about engaging with say current cultural trends current intellectual intellectual trends and uh, that way how much can devotees engage with this say for example with respect to intellectual trends sometimes in back to god we would have the vedic observer column mm-hmm. and we would uh, uh, so I, i sorry so many so many of the things that you write about on yeah. the inter- christian consciousness and, and the modern world yes so now that is generally we take an incident and we analyze it and we present something but actually to seriously engage with modernity that there was earlier an attitude that you know, it's all maya just reject it and just focus on studying krishna bhakti and sharing krishna bhakti but we do see that uh, there are thoughtful people and even and people have come up with their own thought systems which we may say they are wrong but those are the prevailing uh, thought systems in today's world so how far can say devotees engage with contemporary trends i'm not trying talking about trends in terms of fashions but more in terms of thought systems or world views i can see that the gosrupa goswami and others they did engage with the rasa tradition which was prevalent at that time the natya tradition that was there at that time so then a lot of dramas were written by our tradition because dramaturgy was quite prominent in bengal at that time so there is a precedent for that at what do you think about that being done in today's world something similar in a sense it's almost saying um it's asking the question so we've kind of talked about engaging the gross material energy yes modernity you know microphones airplanes automobiles um electricity zoom that's all in one sense gross what about the subtle material energies of ideas and thought processes and and sociology and anthropology and political science and all those things uh can we engage those and 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 i think from from a strictly philosophical point first of all of course the otherwise it's what 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 good is yukta varaga if it's not telling us how to engage everything in krishna's service and how everything is connected to krishna gross and subtle now the question is how expert are we uh, just like say you and i may talk about how uh you know we we should be able to engage wealthy people um but if i'm a young brahmachari who's still attracted to those things or whatever i'm young or old brahmachari guy if i'm too attracted to those things it's not good for me it's not yeah. good for me i'm i might have mentioned this last time i know there's one in the in the lila mrita one devotee i think i did this worth telling again one devotee visited came to prapad after they they left krishna consciousness they, they gave up their spiritual practice and they came back and said to prapad you know you sent me this particular place but i knew if you did i would fall down prapad's response was why didn't you tell me so we have to be a little sensitive about what you know where we fit and i gave the example of myself doing deity worship all day long i mean i love the deities and i'm inspired by the deities and i do a little deity puja but it's not the thing i should be doing all day long it's not my nature so in the same way some of us to say you know should to what extent should we engage let's say on you know with 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 modern in, intelligentsia modern issues and things like that should we all do that no because some of us we don't have that's not our tendency that we don't have the capacity for doing that um but for those devotees that do i would say absolutely we sh- we should engage that uh, that ability to interact with others that just like you know we're we're using um Let, let's say uh, i i go to new vrindavan sometimes as part of my gbc responsibilities and they interact with the neighbors 
And, you know, maybe they share, you know, stories about, you know, how's the waterfall and what did you do to try to, you know, there's, this, there's another kind of insect came this year and how did you deal with it? And, you know, whatever, you know, they're interacting according to that local situation and, and to the local inspiration. Um, <laughs> so some of us, we think and act more on, on those realms. We have the ability to do that. Um, Prabhupada met a lot of very, very big people. And he interacted with those people. He, he met, uh, you know, policemen, and he met mayors, and he met, uh, he met, uh, uh, you know, religious leaders and nuns and, and philosophers and professors and communist leaders. And in every instance, he engaged with them philosophically, intellectually, and discussed Krishna conscious uh, points with them. Um, and 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 look, and be, because because as Prabhupada also said, I mean, Krishna says in the Gita, right? We follow whatever great men does, people follow. So Prabhupada was also very interested in influencing the intelligent class of men, the leader, different classes of leaders in society, because if those people take up a little Christian consciousness, then, then other people will follow suit. So if we have the ability to interact with people in that way, and to, it, it, just like if you're going to give a, if you're going to, like in communications principle, if I'm going to give a Sunday feast and I walk into the lecture, and it's a crowd full of Indian people of Hindu background, okay, I, I'm going to speak a certain way. If I walk in and that particular week is a bunch of 20-year-old, you know, American kids that never been in a temple in their life, they just came over from their college class, I'm going to speak a little, I'm not going to talk a whole lot of stories about Krishna or quote Sanskrit verses. I'm going to talk about where they're coming from. I adapt myself according to the audience. And I have to be able to communicate to them on their, maybe I'm thinking like this, but if they're here, if I speak here, no communications, we're going to miss each other. Yeah. So I have to understand time, place, and circumstance. What kind of language? Prabhupada talked about the Vietnam War. Prabhupada talked about sunsets. Prabhupada, you listen to lectures. Prabhupada talked about your president, Nixon. And he talked about before that, your president, Johnson. He went to India and he talked about our current leaders and how they're not doing this or not doing that. Very much aware of what's going on in the world because he was able, he wanted to be able to, 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 to meet people where they are and help them move up. So for a certain percentage of members of our society to be able to do that, to interact with, 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 with intelligentsia, on religious levels, on philosophical levels, on scriptural levels, on, on, on journalistic levels, uh, on academic levels, and as a social critic. Those are, those are very good. We should use those skills in, in Christian service. Hmm. So it, I like the word it's using skills over here. So it is those who have the skills. It's like how much should a devotee learn music? Now, at a basic level, we know but if somebody has that inclination and that uh, ability, then they can specialize. So similarly, we could say that devotees can have a basic awareness of the world, but if you want to go more into intellectual trends, then they should have that intellectual skill, intellectual nature, and then they can do that. Yes. And just like with everything else we do, they have to be careful. Because there's always a tendency, okay, let's say somebody has an ability to speak in front of big crowds whatever they are, whoever they are. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's nice to speak in front of big crowds. It's a great opportunity to speak in front of big crowds. And you're going to get some fame. You're going to get some adoration. You're going to get some distinction. People are going to come up afterwards and tell you how wonderful you are. And, and there's a real uh, danger of becoming influenced by that. The false ego is still there, the desire to enjoy, the desire to be worshipped ourselves and not to worship Krishna. It's all just under the surface. So we always have to be very, very careful. Just like, you know, person, I, I mentioned earlier, like Krahasta Ashram, it's a wonderful opportunity to become Krishna conscious. But if you start thinking, this is my wife, this is my house, this are my kids, this is my bank balance, you know, no Swami is going to tell me I should donate to the temple. Nobody's going to tell me I should get up early in the morning. I'm the king of my palace. Hey, you're, you're, you know, you're, <laughs> you're back in the cycle of birth and death. We become forgetful again. So as Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavad Gita, there's danger even on the royal roads. So we have to be cautious. And that's why if we're doing, you know, maybe we talk about this next time, interfaith work, or like you do interacting with it, with intelligentsia, um, you know, due to karma Prabhu, he goes to big conferences with people about what, uh, with his work with forbidden archaeology. Uh, some of those people are spiritual, some of those people are not, some of those people are religious, some of those people are not. 
uh, but but there's some shared purpose that he has. That there's some benefit in advancing the Christian conscious movement. So he does that. But but if he or I or you or anybody else suddenly finds, you know, not suddenly, usually gradually, we 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 find it. You know, I'm actually liking being with those people more than these people. And you know, we, if some doubt, if some some weakness is coming in, then you know, I have to be careful. Material energy is powerful, and it can uh, without without preserving our Christian conscience in a very careful way. As Prabhupada said, there's danger at every step. So be bold and be careful. Take risks, but don't be foolish. Hmm. I think that's a very good principle to keep in mind. Be bold and be careful. So it is like cautious courage, we could say. In fact, engaging with the world, we could say that's the basic principle. That if we don't, if, if we're not engaging the world, then there's really no courage. We are trying to stay in our safe zone and the world may not come to us. There may be few people who will come because they are interested to us. But in many ways, it is our purpose to get the world interested in Krishna. Yes. And, and, and to also remember that different people have different ways of doing that. There may be some devotee in the temple who's a little shy, a little bit um, introspective. And their way of spreading Christian consciousness is to worship the deities gorgeously or to cook wonderful prasadam to be shared with people or to clean the temple very nicely or, or to clean my home very nicely so my, my husband, uh, you know, can, we have nice programs at our home and, you know, he, he speaks very nicely because he's one who's more bold. Whatever it is to see where, where's our niche or our niche where we can, where we can contribute. Yeah. The internet. Society for Christian consciousness. That's true. Yes. So, so that, that would be one part of the uh, both the courage and the caution. Courage is that this is where my interest is, but my niche is. That's where I can be more enterprising. And then we have to protect our spirituality, protect our consciousness. Yes. So you know the best one of the one of the best ways to protect. We have to go deep in our own Krishna conscious practice. We go deep and then we broaden ourselves. We have to make sure many, many connections with devotees that, you know, can help us and, and help us through their friendship, help us through their, through their watching us, help us through, you know, we need to have people that can come up to us and say, um, you know, Chaitanya Prabhu, I'm noticing you're spending a lot more time out there. You don't seem as enthusiastic to talk to devotees or Nutama. You know, you're, you're going to all these conferences, but, you know, when's the last time you went to the temple or, you know, whatever, just as an example, that there's people there as a check and balance to help us. That's, that's critically important as well. Okay, makes sense. So, Prabhu, this could be a point where if we can go further today, like with the niche, you know, you have found a niche in interfaith outreach. Would you like to discuss this today or would you like to have a separate session on this? Why don't we have another session? Because actually, I'm getting ready in a couple hours. I'm speaking to 15 people who work, uh, who, who are uh, the directors of dioceses in the United States who are in charge of their interfaith outreach. And, and they're asking me to speak to them for about three hours to talk about Krishna consciousness and Hinduism and Vaishnavism and why we do interfaith. So I actually have to get ready for that. Oh. So next time we talk, I can share a little bit of what that experience was like. And we can talk more particularly if, you, if you'd like to look at, at, at some of the things that, uh, you know, interfaith. And I mean, I'm sitting here, I, 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 I will not talk about next week, but I have, I have a book. This is a book called, it was actually the, 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 the same year as the 50th anniversary of ISKCON was the 50th anniversary of what's called Vatican II which was they did a complete kind of reformulation of, of the Catholic Church in many ways. Uh, and, 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 and there's one particular document called Nostra Atate, which they basically came out and said, you know, we don't have any monopoly on truth, which previously yeah. had been their position and was kind of the position of every religious organization in the world. And they were very bold. So I went to a couple, I, I have some context. So this is a book. I, I, I wrote a chapter in this book. There's many, oh. many chapters. But, but I, I wrote one, and uh, you know, lots of opportunities are there like that. So we can talk about that more next next time we talk. Yes, bro, that will be wonderful. I look forward to that. I'll try to quickly summarize. I think we went over a lot of subjects, but broadly, 
we talk, talk on the topic of engaging with the world and then you mentioned this point of how we we shouldn't judge others and where they are that is like a snapshot so rather than reducing them to where they are we see that how can there be a progression each rather than looking at the standard they are at we can see what is the system in which they can fit by which they can rise upward what's the and video not just the photograph but we want to see the video we want to the see that okay yeah that's a good way of putting it not just the photograph and then it can also be that some people may engage only in one or two ways in bhakti they might just come for classes or they might just do some worship but they might they might they might just do kirtan but not the philosophy so rather than seeing bhakti in a digital way as a one zero kind of thing we can offer them whatever they want and encourage them to move forward the key thing is that we need to encourage because it's voluntary and we shouldn't judge you differentiated between say if we start judging there's a difference between judging and discerning discerning is more for our protection judging is more the holier than thou attitude and then from there we discussed about how devotees if they are working in their professional lives or in their particular dealing with people of other faith so there might be difference in practices difference in beliefs so we needn't make too much of a issue out of it as much as possible we can try to help them connect with krishna and appreciate krishna but no need to make that as a very big issue and then with respect to engaging with the world we discussed about is bhakti anti modern and then you said that we had a conception of bhakti being anti many things like even anti grahastha ashram and or anti west but prabhupad came to the west and most of our devotees are grahastha so bhakti is and we could say at at the very level anti maya or it is not even anti maya because maya is also krishna's energy it is more pro krishna and we discussed about urban and rural that they give a good example that you know, we need to give people the medicine for the disease they are suffering for not the medicine we like to give so that means some people basically everybody is forgetful of krishna but they are in different situations so trying to get people to move from modernity to from a urban setting to a rural setting that may be like uh, giving them a wrong medicine the medicine that they do not need so if that's what they are inspired to do then we can we certainly prabhupad wanted that and prabhupad encouraged that but that shouldn't be what we demand or expect from people what we expect is where they are they connect with krishna and then with modernity of course we see that we have prabhupad used technology we are using technology and then with respect to cultural intellectual trends or if a devotee has a niche devotee has that specialization then they need to do it carefully so i think the principle you said was uh, careful kare careful careful and bold or cautious courage so if we have that then we'll be able to engage with the world and at the same time make sure that we also grow in our devotion so you talked about toward the end broadening and deepening so we deepen by our own practices and broaden by having uh, connections with different people and different uh, especially if what we are doing we are doing it while connected with other devotees and that association will be the check and balance so that way we can move forward with engaging with the world any other points any concluding points to go Wonderful. No, I think that's excellent. I think it's. I enjoyed the conversation. I, I look forward to another one. Yes. Thank you very much. Wonderful talking with you. Hare Thank Krishna. You. Hare Krishna. Thank you.